Tom asked me to talk about writing because it's what I've been doing since apparently I disappeared from the face of the earth. Um, <laughs> there's a website, uh, I forget what it's called, it's something like um, whosdead.com or something. It's where you can vote for if you think somebody's dead or alive. It's, I get like 50-50 people think I'm dead. Um, because I'm known for this one thing that I did that I haven't done again. Um, not that I didn't love doing it, it was great, but I, I'm, this is what I'm doing now, and this is what I love to do now. And I know that a lot of the uh, anime fans are artistic. You like stories, that's why you like it. And um, I know a lot of people write fanfic, and uh, I thought that one of the things that we could talk about today, the workshop is called From Brain to Page, How to Get Your Story Onto the Page. And Mainly, what that's about is structure. So the first thing I want to talk about, uh, if you have a story and you've already been thinking about it and working on it, can you tell that story in three sentences, beginning, middle, and end? Um, you might want to write it down, um, think about it for a little bit. But if you can, just raise your hand and tell us your beginning in the middle and your end. That's hard. Yes, I'm, 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 I don't know how to write a story. But I have a story that I want to write. And I have a beginning and I have a middle. But the ending, I don't know. Yeah, I know what you mean. Sometimes uh, they'll tell you in writing class, find your end in your beginning. And what that means is that your beginning, your character, your main character starts off needing something. And that need isn't the same as a want. Because a lot of times we don't really even know what we need. We know what we want, we don't necessarily know what we want. But um, if you can figure out what your character's need is, even if your character doesn't know it, you'll probably find your own because either they're going to have that need answered or denied, but that's probably going to Does anybody have the their beginning You said two words or three sentences? Three sentences. Let's hear it three words. Innocence, hatred, and acceptance. Okay. Those are qualities, but they're not a well, story. Right, but I mean, if you were to put down words. Uh -huh. I'm, I'm more of a, uh, I can't write, like, per se, yes, but right. I, I love to tell stories. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I could give you three sentences, but I'd have to write it down in full, right? Okay. But, I mean, the three words would explain, you know, the atmosphere okay. of the story to progress. The, and at the beginning, the middle, and the end. What are the characters going through? Uh, well, in a sense, but actually, it's not the same thing. You know, like they don't know, no one knows. And then uh, in the middle, it's just everybody's not with each other. You feel an atmosphere of hatred, mm -hmm. or hatred and anger, and then towards the end, you got like acceptance. Everybody's fine with where they ended. Yeah. So it's kind of like more of an atmosphere. Kind of thing. So. Yes. Oh yeah, I can, I can. I'm confident enough to describe my story in three senses. Okay. I guess. Let's hear. All right. So we have this main character who wants something. He wants redemption, right? He mm -hmm. wants to feel redeemed. He wants to feel part of something. Well, he starts to get that redemption, he, and then he starts picking up this power. But then he gets up. He, he gets something else along the way, something he didn't expect. But in the end, his quest for redemption, his quest for you know just this one thing. It, and in the end, it ruins everything. Okay. And it all falls apart. This is great. I think this is great. I mean, it's uh, this is an example of what we were saying before. Your character has a need, which is going to be answered. Either they're going to get it or not. This one, in this case, he doesn't get it. Or it could be that what he needs is to not get his redemption. Yeah. And uh, but he doesn't get what he wants, yeah. obviously. Yeah. But that's a very good three sentence description. Does anybody else want to try one? Yes. In the story that I've been dabbling on, like, off and on for a long time, uh, characters, uh, she 
he's sent to investigate a war that's marked by a suspicious assassination. Okay. Uh, she fights fights the war, protect, protects, but she also ends up falling in love with one of the soldiers. Uh, in the end, she faces faces her nemesis and saves her love and his friends. You don't want to do it again? No, no, I took a couple of Yeah. Um, that's a good one. Anybody else want to try one? Um, oh, hi. That's all right. Have a seat. These, this little thing is really about the three-act structure, which is what we were just talking about. Um, my writing teacher is my husband. He's a screenwriter, and he's just he's also a teacher. He teaches screenwriting. And he's a really good teacher. If it weren't for him, I wouldn't have been able to write my novel. And he taught me about how the structure works. Basically, um, he drew the picture to me. <laughs> but basically, you know, your story has a beginning, which is not the main part of the story. It's the setup. It's uh, your character. It's sometimes they call it the inciting incident, uh, the thing that sets your character on that road. Um, in my novel of Camelot and Vine, Casey is an actress. She's basically doing commercials. She's not. But she's semi-successful. She's making a living. But she loses her job, she loses her boyfriend, she loses everything at the very beginning, and that's Act One. Actually, Act One is when she falls through the gap in time. <laughs> but um, that happens here. Then here, Act Two is usually, and you'll look at books and movies that you like, you'll discover that it's usually about twice as long as the other acts, or one and three added together would be about the same length as Act Two. But Act Two is the meat of the story. Act Two is where is what people come to see the, the movie for, or they come to read the story for. It's where your character, and I say that singular, but you know you could have a group of characters. But generally, it's one main character who's uh, experiencing what they have to do, going through what they have to do. And then the third act, this, this peak here, is the climax of your story. And then the third act is basically kind of an off-ramp of the bridge, you know, where you, you get out of the story, you don't make people linger too long. Um, you've read those stories where, you know, the climax happens and then it's like, okay, 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 I know this is over, can we just get out of this? Um, you need, there are certain things that you, of course, have to button up, but uh, you don't have to take care of them. Yes. Just a question. Um, what if you start at the beginning with your climax to pull you in and then explain that after? That's um, been done, as you've read. You've read stories that do that. Where uh, it's like a uh, not a flashback. What do I want to say? Prologue, sort of. Yeah. And um, I think it's a personal choice. I mean, I tried it first. I had a bang up, smash up opening scene that gave away the ending, basically. So um, I changed it to a different bang up, smash up that was a little after the opening, not a lot, not too much, um, to draw people in. But I do think that having a, a kind of a blockbuster opening scene is important. It doesn't have to be your climax. You can always go higher. So, if you write a prologue in the beginning, how long should that be? Mm -hmm. I mean, you don't want it to be so long where it's just like. Actually, yeah, there's nothing I'm telling you today that's absolute. I, I mean, yeah, yeah, I know, relatively speaking. Uh, most people, in my experience, it's about a chapter. Yeah. So, a chapter's length can yeah. be a page or yeah. 10 pages. Yeah, or, that seems yeah. Well, yeah. That's, it's enough, you know what? It should be as long as you need it to be, it should, to give the information that you need like to give. Scene or yeah, yeah. Um, so, anybody else want to do the three-word outline, the beginning, middle, end, or sorry, three sentence? Okay. Yes, Karen. <laughs> okay. So I apologize, I can't really talk very well. But um, so the first part or the act one, in, act one. on ramp, <laughs> on ramp. We have um, the characters inside of a post-apocalyptic kind of thing going on. Uh -huh. um, and they, it kind of establishes their world and everything. Uh, they come across something about their world that... Sorry. 
Let's just try to tell it briefly. Yeah. We don't need to know everything. Um, something about their world that they thought was to be true, but is That's cool. like kind of okay. I'm sorry, I can't use words. <laughs> I understand you perfectly, awesome. and I really don't so, understand things besides words. Um, he's also kind of a coward. That gets brought into the story, like kind of against his will. Mm-hmm. Let's say you and um, middle of the story, they start uncovering exactly what's going on, and it kind of is putting them on this unbalance of, mm-hmm. whoa, what's this about our world that we really don't understand? And then in the climax, they confront that, okay. and he's kind of forced into becoming kind of more courageous. He finds That's something good. that he yeah. didn't think that he had. That's an interesting main character, um, and I think that. One thing uh, you are illustrating here, whether you know it or not, is that um, one of the things that's important to the story, your main character has to actively go after what they need. I mean, a main character who just sort of like waits for the man to come and like her, or um, waits for the war to be over, or hangs out kind of, you know, hoping or wishing or whatever. It's not interesting. Um, think of, I don't know, you guys are younger than me, but think of Scarlett O'Hara. You know, she's she's a heroine who, like her or not, she's an active heroine. She goes for it. She makes decisions and she acts on them. And that's one of the reasons why we go back and watch that movie for 70 years, something, you know, or think of The Wizard of Oz. I'm going to a lot of old movies, but those are the ones that I think that maybe we all know. Uh, Dorothy has to take some action. She can't just sort of wait and hope that the witch doesn't find her, you know. You have to, uh, your main character must be active in their own quest. And there's, it doesn't have to be, you know, a quest in the, in the terms of, uh, Joseph Campbell, although that's not a bad idea. Um, but I, in fact, I think my story is kind of in terms of Joseph Campbell. And so far, people are buying the books. <laughs> <laughs> um, can the characters want change during the story? Oh, yeah. Yes, in fact, I think they need change. You need your character to have an arc. You know, they start in one place and they end in another, and they have to change somewhere in here. Yeah. In here. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, no, I don't think it's that interesting. It isn't to me. Yeah. It may depend on who your audience is. Yeah, no. Yeah. More of a dynamic character. Yeah. 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 Anybody else want to try the three sentence? Oh, well, oh go ahead. Actually, it was uh, going on more or less the uh, aspects of the characters when you said they had a drive to go after their quest in a sense. Uh, well, and mine is kind of uh, the polar opposite. He's actually trying to run away from a lot of the events yeah. happening as far as the quest. So the quest Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but through that, he's more or less finding ways to change himself, but he doesn't really, like, he's actually kind of like a dude that's just like, okay, yeah, I'm going to stand over here in the corner, and I'm going to hope that that doesn't come over near me, and I'm just going to work on my little thing over here. At any point in the story, is he forced oh, yeah. to do something? Oh, yeah, he doesn't so really change, to, but, yeah. like, you know, I just wanted to bring that aspect up. Yeah, as as not every, anti-heroes. yeah, not every hero is a hero. I mean, uh... My main character, and some of the reviews are like, "Well, oh, she's this heroine is kind of hard to like, but after a while you start to like her because she's really she's kind of a jerk in the beginning." Yeah. Um, she's she's sleeping with a married man. She's uh, uh, and she doesn't even kind of get that that's not the right thing to do, and she is feeling very sorry for herself because she loses her job and her married man apparently is more in love with his wife than he is with her. And, you know, this is like, well, how am I going to like this character? But she goes way beyond that because she has to. Um, she doesn't seek to end up in uh, you know, medieval battles. She lands there, and she has to protect herself, and she has to, you know, fight. So, yeah, sometimes they're forced into right. action. There still has to be action. All right, well, I'm just, yeah. I just wanted to see if it was a somewhat similar. So. Yeah. You know, you can look at uh, any of your favorite stories. Um, they have this beginning, middle, end, act three structure, generally, because that's kind of what the audience expects. 
you, you have to pay off stuff. And you know, I don't want this to be a lecture. I want you to share your ideas. But um, you don't have to do what the suspension bridge of disbelief says. But I think, I suggest that you at least look at it and look at your favorite stories. Break them down. Look halfway through the story. Is that where the lowest point is? Because on the diagram, as you can see, it is. It's the lowest point. That's where your character reaches their nadir. Yes. Uh, work for Shakespeare. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely. And that's you know he's a good good example. You know. uh, he usually used five acts, but it was still you could still break it down in three. Mm. You know where the character. I mean, in Hamlet. Uh, he's in this terrible position where his father is dead. His father's ghost comes and tells him that his mother is cheating and right. yeah and and he's like but I can't do anything I'm just a kid and um, he finally dies because mm -hmm. he has to and everybody dies yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't get what he wants but he gets what he needs like it or not yeah well, there are some well, variations of stories that are very interesting say mm -hmm. for example lady in, lady in the tiger uh, the entire the entire story is built up and it goes all the way to whether or not this, this man's choice, whether he opens this door or opens this door. And it's that it's this thought process of if I open this door, it could be a beautiful princess, I get married and ever, live happily ever after. But if I ever open this door, there's a hungry, mad eating tiger on the other side, and I will be brutally killed. Mm -hmm. And all of it is just hit the psychology of him thinking of, okay, which which door do I choose? How, how, do I, how, how, do, how do I decide? And the book stops. He opens the door, and that's where the story ends. Mm. It is that. that <laughs> but there. he kept you reading the whole thing, right? It's, it's yeah. suspense. Oh, I just read a book by Desiree Amarano, or I'm sorry, Desiree Zamorano, called The Amato Women, <laughs> where uh, it's like. You think that Desiree sat at her desk going, how can I mess with these people more? Like every time something is happening and everybody seems like they're safe, boom, something else happens, you know? And uh, she kills her main character. Mm -hmm. And it's not that, it's maybe about two-thirds of the way through the book. Uh, and you're like, how can you do that? You can't do that. But she did it, and it worked. Yeah. I mean, look at Game of Thrones, they kill everyone. <laughs> I'm sorry, they killed Sean Bean. <laughs> if you don't know Sean Bean, right away. He's my secret boyfriend. <laughs> I love Sean Bean. Um, and, uh, John, you read Camelot and Vine. Don't you think he'd make a fabulous King Arthur? Oh, my. I, now I'm... Have, that, that's going to be my mental image. I won't spoil it. <laughs> One of the reasons uh, I don't say yeah, it. Yeah, certain characters. Yes, I'm going to. I'm going to. Yep, that, that'd be nice for Casey. <laughs> you know, I don't get to play the part. <laughs> I should have written her as you know late fifties instead of early thirties. Um, okay, so that was uh, the first thing I wanted to talk about is that three part structure. Anybody else have a, a story that they want to talk about in that three sentence way? Okay. So, oh, yes. Did you raise your hand? No, I was just scratching. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do that at auction. No. <laughs> so, I, I yes. do have a question. Okay. Uh, I teach public speaking at a local college. Okay. And one of the big things is that we focus on developing an introduction to the meat of your mm -hmm. speech and a conclusion. What is your methodology for establishing the attention getter in an introduction where you're, you're hooking the reader? That's a good question. I would say when you're doing your first draft, don't worry about it. Just write the story. Because sometimes I think many of us find that the story really doesn't begin at what we thought the beginning was. It begins much later. Uh, but go ahead and write the stuff anyway that you, you consider the beginning to be. Uh, I'm working on one right now, and I sat down and looked at what I'd done the other day, and I was like, God, this is boring. <laughs> but for myself, I guess I'm establishing the characters and the location and, uh, and when I have my opening scene, I'll cut that other junk. As far as public speaking is concerned, I can't, I'm not, 
you know, right? Yeah, just for uh, the methodology of writing this. But I do, I do notice that sometimes people will write an introduction, kind of a setup of the piece, that then gets repeated. Um, often I will skip an introduction because it's it's repetitious, and I know I'm going to read it in the meat of the piece. So I would recommend don't repeat. Um, do uh, what William was talking about, how that story escalated. With a three-act structure, even with that low point in the middle, you can still escalate because you need to keep your reader interested. So what's going to happen next? What's going to happen next? You know, uh, Surprise yourself, and you'll surprise your reader. And that's when, when you're working at the keyboard and all of a sudden you go, oh, I didn't know that was going to happen. <laughs> and that's a great moment. And you can use this for outlining. There are some people who say you must outline, you must stick with your outline. There are some people who say, I go by the seat of my pants, I just write it. And there's some people who do a combination like I do. And none of it is wrong. It is all whatever works for you. Okay? Um, so, let's see, what was the other thing that we were talking about? Um, action, active hero heroes and heroines. I had a third thing. I should have probably um, brought my laptop because I memorized it <laughs> and I've forgotten it. Written your own outline. Uh, what? Written your own outline. Yeah, I did. I wrote it. I just didn't bring it. <laughs> um, I'm interested in fan fiction because I've never read any. I'm confessing. Yeah, I, I, there have been a couple people who tell me that it's a really good thing that I haven't read the Tenchi fan fiction. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I don't think they were talking about the quality of it. I mean, you know, as far as it being well written. Some of, um, some of them remind me of Fifty Shades of Grey. Yeah. 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 I think that's what they Actually, did you know that Fifty Shades of Grey originally was a Twilight was fan fiction? Yeah. yeah. And then they essentially cut out the Twilight part to make it pretty for publishable. Yeah, mm. yeah exactly. Um, and so she was onto something, uh, like it or not, that, you know, I haven't read it. Stop. Sorry to get, like, right up in the camera. But <laughs> the, um... <laughs> The sort of, is it softcore or hardcore? You'd say softcore porn? The written? The e Fifty Shades of Grey? <laughs> I don't know about the movie. I haven't seen that. I don't know. Oh, nobody will admit to I had some friends who read it who were like, oh, it's terrible. It's just terrible. I can't put it down. <laughs> they would read the whole thing and they would say, oh, the writing is awful, but they couldn't put it down. So, I don't know, you know, if you can keep the reader involved, how important is your grammar? By the way, I'm an editor, <laughs> so if you need some help, I, yes. No, I need help. Oh. Well, yeah, I brought, uh, quite terrible. So, you know, if you're really awful, you need a class, but if, if you can write and you're just not perfect, you need a little help. Um, yeah, let's pass these around too. Um, this is basically, it's my bookmark, but it has my website on it. So. Yes? I'd just like to say uh, to give you even more props because I find it amazing when you can both write and edit. I find editing my own stuff, like, I never find my own mistakes. Now, yeah. I always have to have a partner. Yeah. I do too. You don't see them. I think everybody does. Uh, you know, I edit my husband's stuff and he edits mine. And, uh, we end up. I think was pretty clean copy in that way, you know. But yeah, I, I love editing. I actually enjoy it. It's, to me, it's kind of fun. I have to resist being too fast, you know, because I want to tell people, you know, use the extra comma here. <laughs> it's really a matter of choice, um, for example. Yeah. But uh, what I would do and what you would do are not necessarily the same thing, and that's what I have to keep track of. I wish I could remember that third thing because we have some time. I have a question. Yes, William. It's with your writing, or at least your experience in writing. Would you say that, again, you were mentioning a moment ago that many people have either a strict outline, a very, very uh, rigid outline of this is this must happen, and must mm -hmm. happen, and so on, as opposed to the other side where you have it's very free form, very just whatever occurs, occurs. In your experiences, have you found that your stories tend to grow organically, that you have kind of a few base points and then it just flows yeah, forward? I'm glad you said that. 
Uh, that idea, that base points mm -hmm. idea, um, I like to call tentpole scenes. <laughs> you may have not put your story on paper yet, but you know some scenes. You've seen them in your head. You've maybe even jotted a few notes about them. Start, if you're having trouble getting started, you might start with your tentpole scenes. Just write them and put them in order. Um, you know, when you have a few of them and see how you can connect them to each other. You know, it's cold in here, my nose gets running. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, the tentpole scenes are a really good place to start. I don't... I... My husband, his name is John, John Sandal. John outlines. Um, he writes screenplays. Screenplays are uh, a little more rigid than fiction. They have to have, they have to hit certain points. When he is outlining a screenplay, he works on that outline until it's basically a first draft. He can, uh, and his first drafts are like my fourth or fifth drafts. So he works on the outline like I work on the drafts. And for him, that's just much easier. Um, and there's no right or wrong about it. That's just what works for him. I will start with a kind of a loose outline and it will have some tent pole scenes in it. And I just write from there and often I get off track and that can be good or bad. Uh, go down the right way. Yeah, I, you know, I want to be able to find my tent pole scenes from one to the other. Steve, that's why I had a question about because I'm an artist, I have to cut the material and pull it out. And I'm also a writer, so I have all this detail that I can't put down one panel, so that's very helpful. Yeah, oh, that's a good challenge. So you're drawing, um, like, comics, like manga? Yeah. Uh-huh. And that's where I get caught up, because I'm like, I'm so detailed with the writer, and I can't specifically put it in the panel. Well, um, that's because you're telling <coughs> a visual story. So a lot of what uh, you're telling, you can tell in the picture, in the drawing. Same with the movie. You don't have to write a lot of description. She walks across the room. Uh, you know, she has an air of whatever about her. What you have to do is hire the right actors and directors to put the thing together and just put the dialogue on the page. Um, and in your case, it's similar. You can cut a lot of the extraneous description because you can put that in the picture. Yeah. Um, yeah. Good question. Very good point. Because I don't know, are you all writing, uh, what are you writing? Are you writing fiction, film, manga, what are you writing? Fiction. Yes. Fiction, okay. okay. Fiction. fiction. Uh, comic and film. Comic and film. Manga. Fiction and manga. manga. What'd you say? Fiction and manga. Fiction and movies? Mm -hmm. Okay. Comic and Okay. Actually, yes. Poetry and fiction. Okay. Poetry is a whole different animal, as you know. <laughs> um, and you have, uh, it depends on if you want to use structures, but you don't have to use them. And it's a very, one of the things I love about poetry is if you're really uh, particular about your language, you can use one word that'll say 15 things. Yeah, I like to write like very renaissance for some reason. Have you read a lot of Shakespeare? I have. Yeah, he's your guy. I love yeah, he could, he could take a word and if you pick up a I remember coming across livery. I might have been in his use of it in Hamlet, since we were talking about that. And I looked it up in the, um, oh, I don't know, it's the Shakespeare Dictionary, a compendium of, compendium of words where they will tell you how many times a word was used in the Shakespeare canon, and where it was used, and in what way. And in Hamlet, he used the word livery, and it meant five or six things in one place person wears the livery, uh, being a member of the servant class, your livery, um, there's all kinds of words that can be used that way to sort of surprise your reader. And you can use those in fiction too, you know, um, I'm a little bit of a word nut. Yes? Uh, I had a question about world building. Okay. Um, how much research did you put in for world building, I mean, studying, you know, King Arthur, around that mm -hmm. time, that's a pretty big part of history. Yeah. The fall of the Roman Empire. Well, I... Uh, it's hard to quantify it. I worked on the book for years. Yeah. And the bulk of what I did was research. 
and I loved it. It's really great. And the funny thing is, the book is, um, it's not this big, scary tome. It's a fun book. It's, it's uh, uh, not what you call literary fiction, although I think it's very literary, but it's still not categorized that way. It's a time slip action novel. And, but I didn't want to be wrong. I wanted to know as much as I could know. And I, you know, what I found out is uh, there may or may not have been a figure that we based the character on. But if he had lived, then he would have lived around a certain time, the late 5th, early 6th century. So that's what I studied. And I also studied um, some of the characters, excuse me, in the Arthur canon. I studied the legends, yeah. you know. Yeah. But some of the characters in the Arthur canon actually were historical figures, Merlin being one of them. Uh, he was a poet. Um, he had a Welsh name, Merlin, which is what I used in the book. I used the oldest names for most of the characters. Um, Bedwyr, also a historical character, and I don't remember exactly what he did. But these are characters from really old Welsh, you know, uh, books. And but I wanted, you know, I'm setting the story in this part of southwestern England which, you know, some people say, no, he was in northern England, no, he was in France. That all may be true. I don't know. But you, when you're doing an Arthur story, you kind of have to pick because there are so many stories. Um, but I also wanted to know what did they eat, what did they wear, uh, what was the environment like. Um, you know, one of the nicknames of Arthur was the bear, but there were no bears in England at that time. Uh, the wolves were already gone. The, many of the forests had already been destroyed. And um, that was... Thanks for stopping in, you guys. See okay. you. <laughs> um, that, that kind of stuff I wanted to know. If she's going to land in a forest, what's in that forest? Yeah. I had a really good time doing that stuff. Thank you for asking. Yeah. Uh, but I think if you're going to world build, world build, if you're doing something futuristic, you may not have to research so much, but you've got to cover all the details. And you might want to um, do a fact sheet for yourself so you remember. Yeah. Yeah, my, when I used to do like um, role playing games, mm -hmm. a friend of mine, he would use, he'd write like a codex or a Wikipedia. Yeah, yeah, exactly. With all the characters and all this information. Write down stuff like, you know, he has green eyes, um, she's tall. Keep track of all those little details. You think you're going to remember, you may not. And also keep track of the details like, you know, like I think is it wool that happens on several different levels of this world that he created. Um, uh, why am I not coming up with his name? Anybody who knows wool? It's a big futuristic sci-fi sensation. <laughs> uh, I think it ha it's like this future world that happens on different levels of, of this environment, so you can take an elevator food and that kind of stuff. You know, whatever you're building, keep track of what you're building. I draw pictures. I have uh, drawings of the interiors of different places. Um, in, in Camelot and Vine, there's a, there, is, there was an actual dig, an archaeological dig on Cadbury Hill that revealed certain things there. There was a, a long hall, H-A-L-L -L kind of hall, um, it's about 60 feet long, and there was a church building, and there were some smaller round buildings, and so I just, I had, I got myself a map of that dig, and I put it up on the wall, and I placed my story in those buildings, and that was really useful to me, just to have pictures, kind of, kind of visual. Okay. Who else wants to talk about their story? Come on, I'm getting dry mouth. <laughs> <laughs> I want folks to feel like they can share, and I've been kind of lecturing. <coughs> yes, right. Uh, well, actually, I got a good point to do, uh, make too. Actually, I'm working on several different stories all at one time. And I'm right now, but I'm not trying to think. But um, all of my stories all take place separately, but then are all. In, this is a good point. It's all present in the same universe, and they're not connected. But then, 
you'll see aspects where like uh, there'll be in certain areas and you can actually see, say, one of my other creations in a sense, like an Easter egg mm -hmm. in the background, or they'll see a character walk by in one of the panels or. In the and film. that character's in another story. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I, I love. I love that. doing that. You know, yeah. That's one of my favorite things to do. Oh, that's brilliant, and I want you to write this down. This sounds really good. Ren, um, mm -hmm. let me give you a couple of recommendations of more conventional uh, stories where they do that. Uh, one, she won the Pulitzer. It's called Olive Kittredge. And the author won the Pulitzer Prize two or three years ago for that. And it's, it's a series of stories that all take place in the same town. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you see Olive in the stories and sometimes you don't. But these people all know each other and they all live in this town and um, they're all very different. And their paths cross sometimes. There's also one that's older called Waynesburg, Ohio. That one, I just read it recently. It's a little bit depressing, but um, apparently Waynesburg is not a happy place. But uh, where the people, you know, you have a story that'll be about one character, and then you'll see this guy, and he was just in the last story, but he's really just in the story picking up something. But yeah. Yes. Oh, no, no. Oh, you first? Oh, okay. Uh, I just want to, because another story I'm writing, there's this, it's sort of like this, yeah, like that, you have several stories at once, but it's just one story of this man going through the, his memories, and he isn't sure which memory is actually real or fake. He can't tell. Can and your he, reader tell? Um, I'm just curious. It doesn't matter. No. Okay. The reader's not even sure what is right. real until, like, the end part. That's great. I love that. Yeah, I think you should be writing that. Did you put it on paper? Yeah, I already have it on paper. Okay. Yeah, home, yeah. And I mean paper, sort of, you know. Yeah. Euphemistically. That should happen now. Oh, wrap it. Yes. Um, yeah, I have a few stories, and all of them are stuck in hand, not hard to on paper. But um, how, like, for example, um, if you want to, like, kill a character, how much time would you want to, like, develop them so people will get tested them and then snuff them out? It's not about time at all. <laughs> um, I think it's about, you know, how how much you endear your reader to the character. You know, there's some uh, murder mysteries where somebody gets killed off in the first scene. That's probably not enough time. <laughs> That's just a setup. But I, don't lie, I kinda want them to cry. I want the person you want the, I want them to like very cry eyes. I'm like, No, he killed this person. Well, like they lose. Yeah. You have to give your character a personality um, and Wants and needs. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe uh, yeah. those are the things I think that endear us to them. Uh, because we, we have wants and needs as well. So we really we sympathize with characters who are. If you make them too nice, that's not probably going to be the best. And they have to have faults, or at least you know, a couple. Um, you know, a tree to grow through cement. Well, that kind of stuff, you got to look it up. I mean, I had to look up how long does it take for a body to decompose. I needed to know what this body would look like a day and a half after death. 
um, you know, I, I needed to know. And uh, especially, this is one that hasn't been refrigerated. You know, we're talking about it. Well, you did. I'm sorry, but you killed off a character. Yeah. I'm not going to tell you who. Come on, Google. I'll take for a And don't show me pictures. <laughs> yeah, because at one point, my main character, she's feeling responsible for the death of somebody. And she has to be on a barge with this body. And she just can't look at her. So. Yes. One thing that I've always found in damn, I lost track of my thought. <laughs> all right, come back later. <laughs> I yeah. apologize. Uh, That's all right. We can we can talk about it later. Because I mean, it's not like I lost my train of thought when I couldn't remember the third thing we were going to talk. about. <laughs> <laughs> Who else has a story they want to talk about? Anybody? One one thing that we talked about here is. Um, can I use your diagram oh, for a second? Okay. Right. I'm sorry. Um, for those who came in a little late, this is a, just sort of a vague, uh, simple, not vague, it's a simple outline of story structure um, that's useful when you haven't written stories before and you want to give it a shot. Um, there is no hard and fast rule, but this is sort of beginning, middle, and end. And usually your lowest point is in the middle. Um, if you take a novel, and break it down. Say it's 400 pages long. Right around page 200 is going to probably be your character's, your main character's lowest point. Around page 100 is when the major tentpole scene happens that thrusts your character into the action. And around page 300, and this is, you know, it could be 265, it could be whatever, or 340, whatever. But somewhere around later in the story is where the climax is reached, the character gets what they need and you get off the bridge. Um, we also talked about a three word description or three sentence description of your story. If you can describe your story to yourself in three sentences, beginning, middle, and end, you're off to a good start. And uh, once you get those, you need to, oh, I know one thing you need active characters who go after what they want, whether they want to do that or not, at some point they're going to have to. And um, uh, oh, I, just, I just should have write that. Anybody want to go get it for me? <laughs> um, what else? Actually, I remember one more question. Yes, William. Yes, it was dealing with the driving force in a story. I've, I've heard from different authors that some that character should be driving story, or plot should be driving story. That especially when you're dealing with something that has an overarching story and then smaller sub stories as to what actually drives the uh, the plot forward. Is it the plot that we must get to here because the plot demands it, or we want to get here because I, the character, must get get to here? Um, it, more importantly, how the character and character's emotions factor into that. Great question. Thank you. I think that this is another one of those things that there's no hard and fast rule about. If you're going to see, um, I don't know, some action film, it's the action you want to see. You need to see the plot. You need to see beginning, middle, and end plot-wise. You don't really need to see the characters emotional arcs. There will be some. I mean, I'm thinking of Iron Man, for example. Yeah. There will be a character arc in there, but it's not the main thrust of the story. Uh, this is something that's a person, I think it's just personal taste. Some people just, you know, it's the character that's the most important thing to them. That's what keeps them reading. They get involved with the character and then they stay because they have to see what happens. That's more my taste, but I don't think that that's everybody's I don't think everybody has to have the same thing. I do think maybe if there's one thing that you have to have, and that's story, which is the not, not the same thing as plot, exactly. Um, it's a little hard to put it into words, but it's... Like, kind of, so, uh, like war, in a sense? Like, in your own story, you have your own backgrounds, like, say, 
and you have a character that actually will end up researching and through your own little universe find out that there's much more beyond than what the reader's reading. It's, you're kind of breaking the fourth wall in a yeah, sense. Could be. I, I wouldn't describe well, it that way, but it's, <clears throat> yes. Maybe in our way, maybe if you look at the plot points as a destination, but the story as a, overall is like a journey. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. That's good. Now, that's part plot, too. Yeah. But the journey can be emotional as yeah, well as physical. I mean, yeah. It can be a distance or, you know, okay. it can be all those things. Yeah. But um, if there's, were you going to, did you have a question? Uh, no. Speaking to story? Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking when you were saying, like, like um, the story of not more like how the whole world environment had its own element to it and how the character has to make like me get themselves involved in that world yeah. or we're focusing on their who they are and what they're doing at that time. For me and that's like, yeah. yeah. I mean you can have a plot. You gotta have a plot, I think. For uh, you don't have to have a plot. Write mm -hmm. whatever you yeah. want to. But um, your story is going to be about in my case for example, it's about uh, the main character, Casey has to learn something. She has to become a better person. And she's forced into a position where she realizes that she's been failing all her life because she has made such bad choices. And now she's going to make some good choices even if it kills her. So that's the story. It's not the plot, but it's tied in with the plot. You know, and the plot is tied in with that. You know. um, yes? But as you're, as you're writing, you want the reader to become part of that character. I think so. That's a good you know I yes. You want them to, that's right. yeah, and the life that they're living and become part of that character. And goes, okay, where are we going to go from here? Yeah. It's a, it's a two-part series, two-part yes. series. You know, because you become, you become part of that character. So you want to go with them and see where they go, where they end up, and how it ends up. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. But that's really a stupid thing. I had one of my uh, acting teachers years ago explained that the play doesn't happen on the stage. The movie doesn't happen on the screen. It happens somewhere between you and me. You know, it's out here, and it's because of what you bring and what I bring. And that's very different than what you and I bring. Uh, so every person reads a different story. Every person sees a different movie or a different play. And so, yes, that's absolutely right. The character has to be relatable. That doesn't mean you're going to relate in the same way you relate. But, yeah, that's a great point. And I love that about stories because they're so individual and so personal to the readers and the writers. Anybody else? I think we're, yes. Well, um, my story, like, I guess it's, it's a cast of characters. Uh -huh. um, there, is a, there is a central character. Yeah. But what I was thinking about doing for like, the opening was kind of establishing everyone else around the character and then bringing in the character so that I could get multiple, because you know, like I know what my personality mm -hmm. like, and I know what like my, what I hold as my values. Mm -hmm. But you know, I'm also very objective, and I know that many other people have different point of views. So I kind of wanted to establish because my character is is kind of charismatic and can, it can bring groups of people yeah. with different core values into a mix and kind of manage that. I wanted to do that where I established the characters around them first with the completely contrasting views and things yeah. like that. Yeah, well, and you can absolutely do that. It's a lot of times you can uh, you can tell your reader about your character through other characters. Exactly. The way they talk about the character, the way that they act around the character, um, or don't, you know. You can teach us all kinds of things about this guy through what this guy does. Uh, and Shakespeare did a lot of that. And if you haven't read Shakespeare, if you don't like Shakespeare, give it a shot. It's it's a bit of an acquired taste, but once you've tasted it, once you've got it, it's the best stuff. And Shakespeare taught us so much. Uh, we have, you know, a good deal of our language comes from Shakespeare. Yeah. So um, he coined a lot of words and phrases that we didn't have before. Yeah. I'm a big fan. <laughs> 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, okay. Uh, I did a story which is actually going to be like the first part of a novel, and uh, it's uh, uh, it's like a novella length, seventeen thousand words, and the main character is actually not the narrator. Okay. So I, I wrote the story with this narrator who winds up interacting with the main character so that people can like discover this, this yeah. character. And not everything is revealed in this first part. Nor should it be, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Because you want us to keep reading. If you right. reveal everything, you're done. Right. Yeah. So. Yeah, we haven't talked about narrators, but you can have a first-person narrator where I'm saying, I did this, I went there, I walked there, so I'm telling you the story through yeah. the character's eyes. And so what I did is that the, um, the narrator uh, gets saved by the main character. Oh, cool. So that's how they wind up interacting. So is, do, is it in the present tense, past tense? Uh, uh, no, it's in the present tense. Okay. That sounds really good. So. Yeah. Um, and you're going to use it as the beginning of a novel? Yeah. So uh, he gets saved mm -hmm. by the main character. Right. And that's your opening, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, great. Yeah. Yeah. that's kind of what we're talking about, about that blockbuster uh, opening. Because they're obviously going to have to move onward and upward mm. to another climax, but that's a big moment when somebody gets saved by somebody else because it cements a relationship. Right. And mm -hmm. at the end, of course, then uh, well, what's going to happen is in the beginning of the second part, Okay, they're going to part ways, and it's all going to be, now the main character is going to like take over. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's yeah. going to switch um, uh, uh, views, point of view. Point of view, yeah. right. Yeah. Um, absolutely. A lot of people do that. It's perfectly doable. As long as you make it clear, you know, you can do that. You can change point of view. I don't like it when people do it like on the same page. Yeah. It bugs me a little, it's hard to follow. Mm -hmm. You call it head hopping. And, you know, in one paragraph, I'm in one character's head, and in the next <coughs> paragraph, yeah, that's that. too hard to follow. Do but that. you can do it, you know, you can section off your chapters, mm -hmm. put a little space, or you can just do it by chapter. Yeah. Or the way you're doing it, it sounds like you're doing it by act. Like the first act is this one told through mm -hmm. the uh, sort of victim's eyes, and then the second act told through the main character's eyes. Yeah. yeah, the next Point part, the next, the next novella, one uh -huh. story is going to be That's great. told through the main character. Well, I love it. Yes. Um, I know everyone has their own methods and views on writer's block, but how do you get past writer block? Writer's block? Have you ever encountered it? I, mean, I don't know what writer's block is. It's not sitting down and typing. Sit down and type, sit down and type, or write by hand, and write crap if you have to. <laughs> <laughs> write, I just got up, the coffee isn't very good today, I don't feel like myself, and just keep going. You can cut that later. Um, that's, to me, that's what writer's block is. Yeah. It's when I just don't sit down and do it. And, um, yes, Jessica. Um, a lot of the times when I do have that, if I get like into mythology or whatever I'm basing myself off of, that's when it comes back to me. Perfect. So I mean, that's when yes. I'm excited to that. That's great. The, the mythology you're using. Or you can go back to the art that you're looking at. I do Pinterest boards sometimes for stories to just have a picture. Uh, and I, for me, they're locked. Because well, until these stories are out in the world, I'm not sharing that stuff. But um, yes. I like to, uh, every year in November, they do this thing called National Novel yeah, Writing Month, Month. And I, uh, I participate every year. The, the basic goal is to do 50,000 words uh, before November ends. And uh, I found that it's actually helped me a lot. Yeah, that's you know, teach myself methods and ways of getting around having writer's block even occur in the first place. It hasn't mm -hmm. cured it, but you know, what will? <laughs> uh, but it does help a lot. So it also helps me come up with like a new idea get away from the big project that I was working on, do something else, and by the time I come back to what I was working on before, I had new perspective, new ideas, and, yeah, and there's a lot really of support helps break through it. For participants of that too, it's huge. Nano Rimo. 
National Novel Writing Month. It's and it's yeah, a big deal. Oh, you're not doing it this month, are you? I finished it in uh, five days, actually. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> this is five days. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's incredible. Wow. Congratulations. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> that must have been a mean five days. It was, yeah. <laughs> Sleep was. Yeah, caffeine. Coffee and write, and that's about it. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think that's about everything. Yes, do you have one more? Um, Final question, like, um, yeah. I have a mid middle, obviously, and I have an end. Mm -hmm. It's just the beginning, like, I'm, I have multiple ideas how it should begin, and then I was like, I should just kill everyone in the beginning because I'm that frustrated. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, so you're looking for a little advice on that? Yeah, because I have no idea, like, I have two stories I'm working on, and one I really want to get published, but I don't know how I should, like, what's a good idea for good stuff? Should I just make it waking up? Should I have no, 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 no. Don't do Should I have them like wondering somewhere? Don't have that waking up from a dream thing. Mm. Nothing, none of that. Don't. Oh, she got up in the morning and had a cup of coffee and what a bad day. No, I wouldn't suggest that. <laughs> Look at your ending. Because something happens there that hopefully is something that your character needed. Came to all the way through the, the middle part. They got to that ending. Why? Why this person? Why now? Look at that. And start with that person and that one. And that's, when you get them to the ending, it's because of where they started at the beginning. That's why you have that ending. And it sounds a little vague, but I really it's really true. Uh, your character has a need and probably a want. And they may, may or may not be the same thing. But <clears throat> they have to go through all that middle to get to the end, which... Like I was telling these guys that either the need is answered or it's not. Um, but your ending will tell you what the beginning is if you take a look at it and listen to it. Why this character? Why now? Yeah. On, on that note, I, I just, uh, uh, I'm probably not saying it right, but one of my favorite uh, little devices for that is in, in media race, which yes. is where you just start off, you just hit the ground running. Yeah. And that, I, I like using that in anything I read. Uh, that does that, it instantly yeah. hooks me because it's it's just my natural curiosity. I go, well, what's happening? What, yeah. well, who's doing what? What's yeah. going on? Why exactly. is this? And it, it grabs you. So Good. you just gotta you just gotta grab them, and then you can you can explain stuff later, so to speak. Yeah. But when you just gotta get them hooked, you know. And Absolutely. That's, I, I like using. Yeah, it. I mean, I started my story with Casey uh, losing her job, losing her boyfriend, all that stuff. That's in media risk. It's not. Um, it it's not. The big moment where she, you know, falls through the gap in time, but I got to get her there, so it'd be a little weird if we did that first. Although I could have done the prologue and I tried that, but then I would have to go back and explain why this character, why now, why does she have to go meet King Arthur? What does that have to do with anything? It wasn't just for the hell of it, you know. But in my opinion, that is you're going to explain all that stuff to a certain point. Anyway. And you absolutely can. Yeah. I just that was a choice that I made that I didn't want to have to explain that much. So I just and explaining is another thing that we can talk about next time we do this. But you don't want to do too much what they call info dump. Yeah. You want to share that information through uh, the story itself. Yeah. So yes. Now I know that the focus of this is actually developing and writing that story. Mm -hmm. But let's say we have the whole thing put together. What would you suggest, like, the next steps of that? Oh, okay. Well, you've got a first draft. Uh, I suggest that the next thing to do, what time is it, guys? Because you have the next forum. So keep track. It is uh, 6.01. Uh, okay, then we need to wrap this up really quickly. You have your first draft, set it aside for at least a month, more if you can, and then go back and work on it again. Because if you give it some time, you're going to go back and go, oh, I need some more. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you all very much. Thank you.